Dan Abrahams, thank you so much for joining me on uh, on the podcast of Raising Your Game podcast. And thanks for joining me on my podcast because I was actually a guest on yours. Um, and it was great to catch up with you just for the, the past 10 minutes that we've we've just had. But uh, how, how have you been? Lewis, uh, well, look, firstly, thank you so much. Honoured and delighted to be on your podcast. Um, as you say, you came onto mine oh, way back when, almost uh, at the beginning of my podcast. Yeah. Um, uh, and that was uh, before everything kicked off globally, um, uh, before the pandemic. Uh, and uh, so I've been okay. Uh, as you say, we were having a chat off air and um, I've been like everybody else, uh, trying to do the best that uh, trying to do the best I can, uh, just we're all, as we're all trying to do, uh, given the situation. So I've been I've been good. I've been good, relatively speaking, and um, pushing on and doing my stuff, and uh, yeah, trying to trying to enjoy the life that we're currently experiencing as very best as I can. Yeah, I I, I think before I even go into sort of psychology and your story and and your background. What have you like? You, we were talking about the challenges of 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 the last year, and it is is so evident, and we don't have to really go into that. But what have you what have you learned the most, really, about yourself and and what you do over the last year? What have I learned about my about myself the most? Good question. Um, I, I I think. I, 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 from a positive perspective, I I think my capacity to be flexible. I mean, I experienced a situation like a lot of people experienced back in March, 2020 in the UK here, we locked down um, and had the big sort of two to three month lockdown and I lost a lot of consultancy. And so I had to flex a bit. I, I've, I've got a, a range of processes and practices to my business uh, and a, a range of products, if you like, for want of a less crass word that I sell, uh, again, for uh, for want of a less crass word. Um, and, um, and I just had to shift from, I suppose, the traditional sport form of sports psychology, which is very much from a consultancy perspective. I, I couldn't get back on site with some of the um, uh, teams and organizations I was working with. And so um, and so I had to flex, really. And so I paid, uh, I, I flexed and, and shifted on to my online offerings. Uh, and to be fair, that that was you know, relatively successful, not overwhelmingly successful, but relatively successful. So I was certainly pleased in my capacity to flex. Uh, I think the other side of it is that I learned, and this is still a positive, I learned that I had to be stronger in terms of my planning, my organization, my structure. Actually, I think what this pandemic has helped me understand is the importance of structure, diarising things, um, having a, a clear plan um, and making sure that because I've spent a lot of time at my laptop because we haven't necessarily been able to leave the house a lot mm. and we had a period during 2020 when we could but um, and because of that uh, I've spent a lot of time writing and stuff like that and so I've really spent a, a proportion of time planning and structuring my time and so I think I've I, I think I've become better at that um, and I think I recognize that I have to continue to, to to become good at that so um, I'd like to think out of um, the cloud that is uh, the pandemic there's been some some um, I profited in several ways personally I think even from a selfish point of view here I'm, I I really am delving into this year better around my planning and my structuring i think that's mm. something as has there been something that you've used that you found really helpful whether it's a tool or a strategy or a a, a structure that you found that has, has helped you maybe gain that confidence in and uh and for a day to day whether it's week to week or yeah just whether it's a structure or a tool yeah no absolutely um well two things uh, primarily uh, actually using a diary comprehensively. So not just, oh, I have an appointment here, I have an appointment there, I've got to record a podcast here and a podcast there. I've actually said, right, I am going to write about um, golf here. I'm going to write about soccer there. I'm going to, um, uh, so, you know, in simple terms, I've diarized everything. Now, what I've done alongside that is, have you ever heard of the Pomodoro technique? No. 
Yeah, okay, so the Pomodoro technique is it's it's built to help your uh, productivity and specifically your attention as an underpinning of the, of productivity. As human beings, we tend to to get distracted, just as we tend to get distracted on the cricket pitch or the soccer pitch or on the mm. golf course, as I was as a golfer, definitely as a pro golfer. Um, I, um, you know, when we're in our laptop writing, when we're doing work, we tend to be distracted. And I think there's some really like alarming data uh, from research in organizational psychology that suggests that people are distracted up to two and a half hours a day. Like they, people don't work as effectively and as efficiently and as productively as they actually think they do. We're easily distracted. And obviously in a modern day work where we've got lots of distractions around our, our phone, et cetera, et cetera, and social media. Um, and so the Pomodoro technique, it's not that I hadn't heard it before. I had done, but I really tried to apply it, which is um, basically very, very simple, Lewis. Um, 25 minutes on five minutes off, 25 minutes on, five minutes off. So Pomodoro for 25 minutes. So absolute immersion in what you're doing, deep work, essentially, immersion in what you're doing for 25 minutes. Set a timer, timer goes, five minutes off. Start again, 25, five minutes break. You know, do some breathing, relax, chill out, go make a cup of tea, whatever it is you want to do. Uh, do some running on the spot even. Uh, I, I, mm. I've done that, you know, and uh, in that way. But the, the idea is that 25 minutes, you will not be distracted. And, and what I find myself doing is going, oh, I must check Twitter. No, come on, back to work. You know, I'm really shifting my attention in the moment. Um, and, and these are things that I'm working with sports people all the time. So it's kind of practicing what I preach, essentially. And so uh, diarising combined with, I mean, like I've diarised two months ahead. And that diary, those that's always going to change. Like you got in contact with me last week and said, hey, do you want to do this podcast? And so my diary changed today slightly. That's okay. And really, I'm going to treat this hour that we're doing as two Pomodoros. Yeah. essentially so i'm trying to do x amount of pomodoros i'm actually trying to do 16 absolutely bang on pomodoros a day which adds up to six hours and 40 minutes of bang on work and by the end of the day you're absolutely shattered i've i've added in an hour for fitness i'd, I'd run and then i add in two hours for a walk uh, with my wife who works with me and lunchtime as well um and uh, i start at eight in the morning i finish at seven at night and so and because I'm not really going much on site at the moment with clients, um, that's most of my days are at home. So I'm trying to do 16 Pomodoros in this daily time, in daily period, plus a run, plus a walk, you know, plus normal stuff of eating, what have you. Um, and that's, I'm finding myself being quite efficient. Um, I'm, I'm quite enjoying it, actually. Have you found in those little five minute gaps that you you might have that little fleeting thought and go i'm going to check twitter and then mm. you're sent down the cyber algorithm Aha, yeah. rabbit hole that grabs yeah, a hold but... of you and sucks you in for another 10 more minutes and another 10 more minutes and do you know what i mean and that, and i think that's where people really with something like that people fall down with that and that's not just a yeah that's a distraction thing but those things are designed to distract you and take you away from the work that you're doing and as a sports psychologist, what I would say to you, I'll give you the theory and then I'll talk to you about in practice what happens. But the theory is that's where you're looking at, at somebody's motivation. How, how are you motivated? Yeah. So I have quite a strong need for achievement. Uh, so uh, it, 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 extrinsic motivation uh, actually helped me. Everyone that nowadays talks a lot about intrinsic motivation. I'm not saying that's not there because one of my values, which is very much intrinsic motivation, um, is... Um, um, work ethic um uh, so so that drives me um but a need for achievement drives me as well um so i've got a couple of projects at the moment ongoing that are very important to me and important to my career so uh, i'm saying that because i remind myself of this and it relates very much you're going to be impressed i remember this here but it always stuck with me how you used to when you went when you uh, when you used to go for a run as a kid you had a steep hill that you used to climb i had yeah, to have yeah. to run up yeah you're smiling out yeah, yeah. And, and you used to think about was it the contract or something like that that you would in in many respects that's not necessarily intrinsic motivation that's extrinsic motivation yeah. that's a need for achievement that's an outcome oriented goal uh, and that's okay people need to understand that that's okay that 
it's it's a perfectly reasonable thing that can drive you. And so the reason I'm answering it this way as a sports psychologist to help people shift their attention. Motivation is a big deal uh, to shift back onto the task at hand. And so um, provided I remember, which is always an important thing, I will use the factors that motivate me to ensure that what you've said doesn't happen, that I'm going back to my Pomodoro, you know, and, 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 and there's an element of identity in there as well. I like to be structured and I like to the, the remembering that the satisfaction you get. Uh, so this is identity as a form of motivation, the satisfaction you get at the end of the day saying, I did my 16 Pomodoros, I stuck to my tasks. Mm. I am being the person that I want to be. I'm being who I am. Um, I think that's a massive driver for me. So that helps me shift back on to, right, get this Pomodoro done, get this Pomodoro done. Now, as a caveat to all of that, what I would say is I don't always stick to the 25-5, 25-5. I often go 25 and I'm, I'm so in the moment, I'm like, right, let's get another another Pomodoro done straight away. Mm. So I'll just click on uh, start again on my my um, phone for the um, timer. timer. Thank you, timer. And uh, we'll do another 25 minutes. And I can do four lots in one go. And I find that's okay. I give myself permission to do that. That's okay. Mm. So, um, yeah, that's how I treat that. Would you recommend this this tool and this technique in in a sporting context? Interesting. Um, I, I I suppose it depends on the context. It depends on the sport. I mean, if I go back to my golfing days, I, I, I would personally. I think as a as a pro golfer, I think one tool could be to Pomodoro a, a period of time. It doesn't have to be twenty five minutes, but it probably doesn't want to be longer than 40, longer than forty five minutes. But it could be that you know I talk a lot about variability of practice to golfers, and so you could do say twenty five minutes of real good work technical work for instance uh on the range uh and then you can pomodoro that for 25 minutes and then take five minutes whilst walking to the putting green and go and do 25 minutes of uh, a task related to putting and so on and so forth so i think the pomodoro technique I, I think in my mind could work really really well with golf uh i think one would have to ponder and consider other sports and the dynamic of practice and things like that uh do you think it would work in cricket or I'm not thinking, so much i just think it probably le- it will lead on to a question i have for you later on about sort of open and closed skill sports and the difference yeah. in psychology there but i think um i think just from my own experience and, and this is almost stemming from what we've had go on tonight and i'm always talking to young athletes about when you're trained and you you would have probably said this a thousand times is when you're training train with purpose train with uh, something that you're trying to get out of that session very simply and i just think if one of the biggest tools i find sometimes for creativity and you need that creativity within your sport is limitation and if you limit yourself with the time that you're allowed in there then you actually become very um you become very productive and very your quality of training goes up. So an example I would give is as a professional bowler, when we were playing, uh, when we were training, there was a lot around managing your body. There was a lot around making sure that you didn't over bowl in training. So they actually stopped us at four overs, which is 24 deliveries. So literally 24 deliveries. And it's like, right, what are you going to get out of this session? And then I'm thinking, well, I need to be bowling for for hour on end to in order to get something out of the session and, and grind away and go hard. When actually it was like, well, no, here's how I'm going to do it. I've got six balls at the start. I'm gonna that's going to be my sort of opening gambit, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best six balls to start with. I'm gonna try as hard as I can for those. My twelve in the middle is going to be play time. Is when I'm going to try something new. I'm going to continue. Uh, developing a new skill it might be a slower ball it might be uh, a, a bounce it might be a yorker whatever it is and then my last six will be a repair set part of the session where i'll just go back to that first six i may have, that's one example i may have done 24 balls of just trying to hit the same ball and that's a quality session but i've only got 24 balls to do it and that limitation allowed the the idea of being more creative in getting more out of your your session and then really honing in and going if i'm going to try and bowl this brand new ball that I've designed and come up with and I want to bowl and I've never done it before. 
I'm engaged in that because it means something now. It's not, I'm going to have another go in a minute. It's no, I've, I've got a cut off. This is, this is ending. And, and that, that for me is, that's why I actually, as you were talking through it, I think it, I perhaps kind of did it this in this different version because 24 balls may take you 40 minutes, whatever, but yeah, I, I actually think it would work. I think it, I think something like that is really powerful for an athlete to be able to separate your time and be able to delve into quality work rather than aimlessly training. I love what you said there. And it, it reminds me of a few things as you were speaking there. I was thinking of the, the mental skills I always talk about of uh, the mental skills of a attention so that that limited time drives your attention mm. um your intensity it's very difficult to be uh to um replicate the kind of intensity that you'd like to have for two hours but for 24 balls 40 minutes um it becomes easier and more necessary and intent a positive intent on every every single ball you know sticking to your tasks sticking to your process sticking to what you want to do so attention intensity and intent and it also made me think now as you were speaking about the you know you were going very much into a granular process there you really uh, you know, you were talking about, well, 24 balls and six balls, I'm going to do this and 12 balls, I'm going to do this and another six balls, this, and and then you'd probably go even deeper. And, it, you know, it's the what, in a sense, the what, the how and the why, you know, what do I want to achieve here? You know, I want to do 12 balls in the middle that are going to be created. I'm working on something new. How am I going to do that? You know, and it, you, you then might talk about, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to have this kind of grip on the ball. And I'm going to have this kind of run up and I'm just going to release my body a bit more here or whatever it is you would do as a bowler. And then, um, you know, uh, why? Well, why am I doing that? Well, because uh, I, I want to be able to fashion a ball under pressure, you know, and, and or, or, or mix it up a bit more out there. So the what, the why, the how. So there's, there's just feels more a more granular sort of a, a, a approach there. So I love what you were saying. Yeah, especially when it's um, especially when it's scenario driven. It was it was yes. really really easy like that that was really easy to then straight away put it in a practice in match and and again talking to a couple of the young guys tonight and cricket being a bit of an interesting bowling as well it's kind of a semi closed and open skill because you, you're essentially doing the same thing yourself but the batter can change and do what they do differently the pitch changes and and you want to bowl in different areas but. Ultimately, you want to be at the top of your mark, trying to have your process that you're driving through and, and have that that feel, whatever it is that you've done through practice and just deliver it in, in, in a game. And that has, to, in order to find that, in order to, to find out what it is and learn what it is for you, what works well, what doesn't work well, how did I do it this ball that got a better result there? You have to have that exploration, that, that, that bit of moment of free open play in training. Otherwise, you'll never go anywhere. You'll just get stuck. Um, but you have to have that focus. You have to have that that deep understanding and feel like feel your body, feel your body, feel like how it was, where your mind was at when you're at the top, and and it gives you a bit of a review process. I I probably didn't give myself as much credit when I was doing it because you're kind of going into this feedback loop without even knowing, and I didn't realise I was doing it. And, and and now sort of looking back and reflecting I go, wow that's actually what I was doing and now I just take it I, I kind of took it for granted and kind of do it now anyway naturally and it, it's, it's hard work trying to get it across to someone but once you've experienced it you you're in you that's it you you understand it well the two things again two takeaways there for me are um, psychosocial I mean everything you're talking about is psychosocial and uh, that, you know that's not a, a very funky cool term I know but, but uh, you know the psychological and social but the psychosocial drive the technical tactical and physical sides you know they're all the technical tactical and physical sides are underpinned psychosocially and everything you're talking about their effective practice means great psychosocial processes the other the other term which I, it, it's right you mentioned this term feedback loop the more I work with professional sports people and developing elite sports competitors, the more I, I understand the importance of building in feedback loops into both practice and play. 
um and you know and that can be as basic as with with the soccer players the footballers i work with here in in england and i would get the i'm blessed to have the opportunity to work with some of the best players in the world a very very simple feedback loop is give me a mark out of 10 for performance and give me a mark out of 10 for mindset mm. now that latter one mark out of 10 for mindset is never thought about really i mean that's mm. just always new for players um the mark out of 10 for performance actually they quite like because they live now in a world of data they so much data thrown at them these yeah. days that uh, from video analysis, which is a good thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it's nice for them just to just ponder a subjective score. Yeah, seven out of ten. You know, as compared to last week when I was six out of ten, I think I made some more high intensity runs, got on the end of crosses, and just nipped in to score that goal. Seven out of ten, and for my mindset nine out of 10. Okay. Why, why so high? What was good? So just, I'm saying that because I'm just reinforcing this notion of feedback loop. And if we can build that into training to practice and we can build it into, to, to play that, that, that to me is the groundwork of improvement. Yeah. And it's self-driven as well. It, it ends up being that thing where you don't have to have a tool. You don't have to have anyone over your shoulder. It's just happening when it's going on, when you're playing and, and you self coach, you self chain you self adapt whatever it is you you're able to do that yourself it's it's so powerful um look look let's let's delve into where where you you started off where you came from so your background was in golf where did the sport journey start for you and then where did the world of psychology jump in for yourself uh, um just start wherever you want to start take you take it from there yeah, well, look, I mean, uh, very briefly, you know, very, you know, when I was very young, probably like you, I was a mad sports nut and played all sports, played cricket a lot, to be fair. I mean, that was one of my early loves and um, picked up a golf club at 13, uh, probably for the ability I had just a little bit too late, um, you know, um, never have regrets, but uh, I wish I'd taken up uh, taken it up a little bit earlier. Um, and then just throughout my teenage years, I think all the other sports uh, I started to stop you know playing rugby and football and and cricket and 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 golf took prominence and um, um, probably got in the way of school a little bit um, and and I, I actually picked up a sports psychology book um, quite early um, I say sports psychology in inverted commas um, Timothy Galway's in the game of golf um, which is kind of you know, it is psychological, but so I picked up that up when I was about 15 years old. Um, and then, um, read a few textbooks and then at 18 left school became a pro golfer um was never really going to be quite good enough um spent a few years playing full time did my pga qualifications to to coach the game and when i realized i wasn't going to be able to to play for a living um and have any kind of <laughs> standard of life um i i started to coach the game and i think i fell in love more with the psychological side uh, you know, in 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 golf uh, as a coach, it's a bit different with other sp uh, than other sports. You get the opportunity to coach forty hours a week. I mean, you're just coaching all the time. Um, and so I was doing a lot of coaching and I started to do a degree in psychology at that time and a master's degree in sports psychology. Um, and then I just came to a crossroads. Do I? carry on with the golf coaching and have the additional qualifications there on the side or um, do I become a full-time sports psychologist and I had a bit of a yearning to work in other sports and other areas of life and and so I thought no you know what I'm going to put the golf clubs away for a bit and I'm going to become a, a sports psychologist so I became a registered sports psychologist about 15 years ago and that's what I've been doing for the past 15 years and I, I've I always uh, I would say I, I've specialised in two sports uh, predominantly. I mean, I've worked across all sports, um, but uh, golf and football, soccer would be the two sports I've mainly worked in. Golf, obviously, no light at the back of my hand, um, but uh, football I've worked heavily in for 15 years. Um, I've held a number of positions, I've been lead psychologist for England golf, lead psychologist for England rugby, working alongside Eddie Jones. I know you're living in Australia right now, so fairly famous <laughs> Australian coach. Um, and worked with a number of Premier League football clubs and championship football clubs and written four books, three of them football, one golf. Um, 
And so it's been a, it's it it it's been a, a journey. I've now got my own podcast, which you've been on the Sports Psych Show, and and uh, a couple of um, online platforms um, that help players, coaches, and parents work together on the mental side of the game, a video online platform. Um, so I've got a, a finger in a number of pies. So so that's my background and that's what I do now. So you, you touched on it there, like you said you working with players, coaches, mm. and parents. Mm. In that, th- is, is that it all at once if you're working <laughs> with a single, single um, I guess, unit of, of for a player because they're sort of their team, I guess? And... Um, God, I would love to pick your brains on parents. And I did a podcast on parents in sport because giving my own thoughts on it. Um, and I think it is a fascinating dynamic that we have. You probably could go into a podcast on its own there. Uh, what was your own sort of experience with your own mind in the game? Um, and even you could probably add in there where your parents helped out or, or sometimes hindered. It, yep. it, can, it can be a case. Um, yeah, what was your own experience with your your psychological game? I think when I reflect back, um, my, 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 I really struggled. I mean, I think it, it, it wasn't necessarily or didn't feel like a factor until my handicap really started to come, to come down to single figures. And I didn't, I just like it. I mean, like some professionals now, but a, like a lot of young players, it's just you wouldn't have even thought about it. Obviously, I, as I said, I read Galway's book around 15, 16. But even then, I don't know if it really hit home that sometimes when I was going out and playing tournaments, I was having these thoughts over the ball um, that I would, you know, emotion might get in the way, feeling might get in the way at times when I was out there. Now, when I reflect back now, I think, you know, my word, you know, I, if I, when I was off a two handicap at 17, if I'd been better mentally, I could have been scratch. I came down to scratch in a year after that. But, you know, around that time, I wish I'd been a lot better mentally because I really think I could have kicked on more. I don't think I, it would have made a difference to have got me into sort of a world ranking stage. I was always just not good enough as a pro. Um, played some, you know, played the mini tours. But when I played the mini tours, I mean, boy, I, I, I would have, I've always described it as if I'd been much better mentally, I would have had more fun and I would have won more money. Um, it's as simple as that. And, and I just, I would have put myself in contention. I would have given myself chances to win. I would have won a few local events. And that, that matters. That matters. So my experience was that I needed to be a lot better. My experience, my, my parents were brilliant. They were always supportive. They never played golf, wouldn't have had a clue what it was about. Um, and that, you know, I think that that kind of hindered a my dad's conversations with me my dad was a wonderful is a wonderful father and very attentive and they just wanted to give me the best opportunity to do what I wanted to do and um, they wanted me to get an education but they they wanted me to you know give it a go uh, in, if I wanted to give it a go and I think with uh, you know they both tried their best to support where they could but neither of them 100 percent think knew what to say in terms of the the granular detail, the intricacies. Um, and so they kind of, you know, they supported but didn't really get too involved. And I think that that, that, that was a positive thing, essentially, um, because I think it's when parents don't know what to say, but then they start to say things like, you got to win here, you got to do this, you got to do that. And... I think my dad one time said something like, oh, you should be, this is going to sound absolutely ridiculous. I don't want to embarrass him, but he said, you know, you have tennis players grunt when they, you know, they sometimes grunt when yeah. they serve or when, and he said, you, sh- you should be grunting now when you hit the ball. And it was like, yeah, dad, wrong yeah. sport. <laughs> wrong, yeah, that just doesn't happen. And I, and I think it was things like that that helped him to clock. Yeah, I just need to step back and not say anything here because I don't understand the game. And that's fine. Um, uh, but there's nuance to that, isn't there? And that's when mm. parents get involved and they're doing it out of love, you know. And, and we come back to the motivation side. We come back to what do people value and what, how do people – and I suppose the perception – 
people have, human beings have on how people get ahead in life and get on in life and how people should, uh, what a good life is and how people should act in life. You know, and some parents, I do a lot in America and the culture in America can tend towards, and there's a lot of people in America, so it's going to be a very generalized uh, comment here, but it, it can be very much the need for achievement and sports is a vehicle for that. And so there's very much a, a, a can be a culture towards win, high performance, raw at the side, punching the air, you can achieve anything. And it and it, at times it can, like it can in Britain, lack a bit of nuance and a bit of understanding around motivation, around performance, and around what a rich life is and around what participation in sport should be. Um, it's kind of either seen as a vehicle for the elite to get to the to the elite or a vehicle to win or a vehicle to improve yourself as a human being. I think we, we've really forgotten that sometimes sport is just really cool to participate in mm. and it's just sometimes nice to have free play, you know. So I, I just think there's that, that interesting dynamic and I'm saying that because I just think that impacts how parents – uh, communicate and respond and react and how they behave in sporting environments. Again, it's all done out of love, but somebody can do a lot of maladaptive things out of love, for, you yeah. know, for their child uh, without realizing it and still stay very steadfast and be quite robust in terms of, nope, this is the way it should be. It's out of love, but it's actually maladaptive. So yeah. I think it's, a, it's an interesting landscape and one that will never be perfected, if you like. No, it's, it's, it's so interesting that you say that. It's almost like you're trying to tell a parent, like, you, if you don't know what to say, then sometimes just not saying anything or even just not even giving your own perspective, your own opinion, your, your own viewpoint can be powerful because you want to find out what the athlete, your son, your daughter is thinking and where they're at. And I think that's probably the part for me that I think is something I mentioned in the podcast was asking what they want. I think I had this conversation almost post my career with my parents and, and talking about well, how how did how I felt I needed them to support me and what they felt they should do to support me. That what all coming from love, but at the right at that time was the wrong thing. Um, and I had the answer, but I was a young boy and probably didn't know how to 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 get it out so i guess my my advice to parents and and maybe the same sort of thing you're saying there is sometimes if you're you're thinking of what, what you're about to say is the right thing it may not be uh, and it and, and that is it's such a god yeah it's such a tough one because do you say something don't you say something if i say nothing is it damaging even more like all the yeah what big rabbit hole that you could go down there with 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 that one um but but, but i think to, you know just quickly here i i think what you're saying is very pertinent and really it comes back to asking questions you know if nothing else parents are best served asking questions you know did you enjoy your experience today what did you enjoy you know what did you get out of that experience open-ended questions essentially uh you know what did you get out of that experience uh what did you learn today um i, I if nothing else, I think that's the most useful path. And if your child doesn't want to talk, then fine, no problem at all. Um, just leave them be. Um, I, I think that's the safest place to be, in my opinion. Um, I just think for me, a parent in an ideal world needs to be monitoring the, if they're going to monitor anything, monitor the experience your child is having mm. um, and and strive to understand what your child at once and there's a difference between wants and needs you know you might feel as a parent they need something else but I think you've got to chip away at that um, and also get a 360 degree viewpoint of whether you think what they need is correct so questions and wants what does your child want and then asking questions around that and just generally asking questions and just keeping a keeping a a, a, a uh, an interested detachment essentially mm. from it, I think would be a nice way of putting it, putting it. That's, that's a really great, really great advice for sure. Um, I know people will love that. Um, we spoke about, you've spoken about how you're in golf and soccer football, as we would know. It. Um, what have you found are 
differences, but two different sports, one a predominantly closed skill sport and another an open skill sport. So a lot of changing environments. How have you, how do you change your approach to those psychological uh, parameters in those sports? What are the psychological differences that you see? Sport, um, golf in its own right, always follows this mental side of the game. People are talking about it is 95% mental. Uh, and yes, the players are highly skilled, but it is the guys that succeed at the top end that have that huge edge. So I guess there's a few things to unpack there, but but what would be those main core differences that you see from golf to a sport like football? Yeah, I think I always think it's really interesting. Uh, you know, everyone talks about golf being 95% mental and I... I, I I, I reserve. I don't know if I reserve judgment on it. I, I, I keep an open mind about that. I mean, we talk about percentage, and I'm sure you'd agree that sometimes it's a throwaway remark, and 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 it's difficult to put a percentage on. They're kind of mm. it's 100 percent of everything, really, technical, tactical, physical, mental, emotional, etc. But I think um, you know the first thing to say there is. Um, when you're dealing with open sports, you're often dealing, as you say, changing environments, quick sports, uh, sports where you've got to make split second decisions. Um, and they're often team sports. Um, and, and that's, and, and so the team versus individual is the big difference. Um, and then, but the notion of, quick versus slow sports so so golf you've got a lot of time to think oh golf is psychological because you've got a lot a lot of time to think um and say let's say football isn't because there's no time to think is a complete misunderstanding of how the brain is structured and and how it functions and actually funnily enough on my own podcast a few weeks ago i was talking to one of the world's leading neuroscientists in fact she's one of the world's leading scientists she's in the top one percent cited scientists on the planet a woman called lisa feldman barrett um, and um, she's just released a book on the brain, which I highly recommend. And uh, we were talking about this, how the, the brain works in milliseconds. The brain works in milliseconds. So it actually takes 0.01 milliseconds to for us to experience feeling. Okay. The way our brain works, our brain is constantly mapping our body. Um, it's a process called interoception interoception it's constantly mapping our body the data uh, uh, that's being uh, sent from the body to the brain um uh through our organs through our immune system through the release of hormones and so we're constantly feeling all the time we constantly feel pleasant unpleasant feelings uh sense of lethargy sense of energy um and and so um when players are competing in in rugby, in football, in, no matter what the sport, you're constantly feeling, you're constantly experiencing the sensations in your body, uh, and and so that's that. What that means is that these quick sports are highly psychological as well. As human beings, we function in milliseconds, and so um, uh, you you can experience feeling in milliseconds. And, and that can take you off, you know, it can distract you, it can get in your way. And so the notion of, of these sports, open sports, not being psychological is a myth. Um, and then when you add the team element, you know, if you think that in, say, a sport like football, like rugby, the demands are the game works in seconds, your brain works in milliseconds, you've got to pay attention constantly You've got to constantly scan your environment. You've got to stick to the responsibilities within your role. And then you've got a team. You've got to demonstrate intrapersonal skills, or sorry, interpersonal skills yeah. as well as intrapersonal mm. skills. So uh, the reason why I'm saying this is because <laughs> very unpopular in the golf community now, I'm going, well, actually, I find football to be more psychological than golf. I, I think golf is a fascinating one. I'm not saying it's not psychological. But ultimately, you've still got to adhere to the laws of the golf swing. You've still got to be able to return the club head back to the ball. You know, it's, it's, it's the, the path the club head goes on, travels on. It's the angle of approach. It's the, ang uh, it's the um, centeredness of contact. It's the speed with which a club strikes the ball. Um, 
the, the angle of the club face for impact. There's five laws of the golf swing in that respect. And so it's, it's still a very technical sport. You can't just do anything. How people swing clubs is very different between people, absolutely, depending on their, 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 their physical selves. But, um, but there's still laws of the, swings, of the swing, and, and, and so it's still a technical sport. Um, and I know some very, very, and I've played with some very good golfers who've made a lot of money from the game who are actually quite poor mentally but they've got so much skill in their hands that they just get away with it you might have you must yeah. have played with cricketers who, yeah. are, who are just poor mentally but boy they've just got so much skill you know you get it in football as well you know who, who, who are probably out on the pitch have bad thoughts and feelings and unhelpful thoughts and feelings but they've just got a whole pile of skill so so uh, or you know physical presence so i think it's a really interesting dynamic uh, how that works out for me as a psychologist, look, it just varies. I, I, one of the challenges you have as a psychology a psychologist is that psychology is unique, you know, mm -hmm. to every every individual. Yours is different to mine and mine is different to somebody else's. So you've got 25 footballers in a squad and each of those players is going to have a different uh, challenge psychologically. Um, just as every golfer is going to have a different challenge psychologically. No one size fits all. Uh, I think we can make, like I've done already in this podcast, you know, we can, we can assert certain assumptions. So, for instance, I, as earlier, I talked about three mental skills, attention, intensity, intent, you know. Mm -hmm. And if we look at this from a cricket perspective, whether you're a bowler or a batter, you know, you've got to pay attention to the task at hand. You probably can't bowl very well if you're distracted. You probably yeah. can't bat very well if you're distracted. So attention, uh, it, it's a bold statement to say, I can give you a sport where attention isn't important. So we know we need to pay attention. And with that, we know we need to deal with distractions quickly, as quickly as possible. What we also know is you probably got to compete at the right intensity. We might use the term levels of arousal in psychology, which is a horrible term, but you've got to compete at the right intensity. We don't want to be uh, under activated and we don't want to be overly activated. And then um, we've got to be able to execute with positive intent. That might be confidence, if you like, but I, as a bowler, I want to be running up there with a positive intent. I'm sure you can picture that and feel that. So attention, intensity, intent. And it doesn't matter what sport I've worked in. By and large, in the arena, those three skills are vital. Now, how a, how a performer, how a participant does that is different for different individuals. But what I'm fairly in, as a sports psychologist, my belief is that every single participant or competitor needs a framework to the mental side of their game. So if we got, went back in history and I was, we were standing there together in the nets and we were working together, I'd be saying to you, Lewis, I'm really passionate about you having a framework to the mental side of the game so that when you know you're coming on for your spell, you know, no matter where the, no matter your performance, if you're bowling at nine or 10 out of 10, you're bang on, you're pitching it where you want to. And, it, and, it, and it's great. That's fine. That's fantastic. You're going through your framework. If you're at six out of 10 and it's a bit sketchy, you're not quite hitting your, your mark and, and, and you're not quite there, you've got a framework there that's going to help you to optimize your performance so you can stay at, at least six out of 10 or better. Yeah. You're not coming to five or to four where suddenly it starts to be disastrous. So I'm passionate about players, no matter their sport, having a framework to the mental side of the game that helps them be at their as close to their best with attention, intensity, intent. And that just doesn't matter what sport it is. So I don't know if I've gone off a complete tangent there, but no. open, closed, every, every sport is demanding psychologically. I think every competitor needs a framework, but how that framework is done is done individually. The last thing to say here is I think in a team sport, though, it's useful for your teammates to know, have some idea of what your framework is. Because when you're out there for you, when you're out there and you're bowling, if you've got a mate who's going, hey, Lewis, stick to this game face, use this, use that, remind you of your framework, it's not just the burden on you to remember it. Somebody else can help you. Yeah. And in a sport like football, that's vital. So, yeah, yeah that's my long-winded that, answer. No, that's really that's really valuable. It actually almost leads me into this, this next bit where I've heard you speak about it uh, and I, I'd love for you to describe it, this, this idea of match scripts. Mm. 
Um, yeah, so 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 match scripts are again. If we go on a basis of attention, intensity, intent, it's very much around the attention piece. Which is, look, when I started to get involved in football, um, I started to notice that in sports psychology we talk a lot about being process oriented. Um, and, and when I started to get involved in football, when I sat down with players and I said, "Well, look, what are you trying to achieve?" You know, come game day, come match day. And they would talk about, well, I want to win and I, I want to perform well and I want to stay in the team and I want to do this. And very rarely would they talk about anything that was specific, anything that was controllable out or as con- close to controllable as possible. And, and so I mean, this comes under the theory of achievement goals, uh, achievement goal theory in sports psychology, which states that we can, when we're, when we're in a, 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 a an achievement setting, so a performance setting. We tend to be either ego oriented. So I want to perform really well. I want to beat the opposition. I want to win. I want to perform better or um, task or mastery oriented. So this is about getting task or mastery oriented. And so I started to help footballers rather than got to win, got to win, got to win, got to perform, got to perform, got to perform better than others, got to stay in the team, those kind of things that aren't very specific, aren't very controllable. Um, I started to get them to pinpoint one to three things that they could control or at least get close to controlling that were specific and that were positive things that they wanted to achieve rather than didn't want to achieve. Like I don't want to concede or I don't want to uh, make some bad bowls or bowl a pour over or something like that. Um, And so an example, one of my first clients, he allows me to talk a little bit about this because actually he featured in my first book. uh, uh, Some people listening will remember him, Carlton Cole, the former West Ham striker and started working with Coley back in 2007 when he was languishing in the West Ham reserve team. And 18 months later, he made his England debut. And when I sat down with him for the first time, he said, well, I want to win and I want to score and I want to, not very controllable, not very specific. And I think when he made his debut for England, and it was actually against the world champion Spain, I think his match script was this. It was always look for space, specific, controllable, positive, always look for space. So it doesn't matter what happens out there. Number one job, always look for space. Um, uh, uh, Number two was nonstop defending from the front. So again, specific, controllable. Um, And then number three, get shots away. Specific, not fully controllable, but as, you know, closer to controllable than want to score and positive. So those three things. And so very much the narrative going into that game wasn't don't mess up, got to win. I mean, there was always the element of those thoughts coming in, which they do as human beings, but it was, no, come on, what am I going to do against Spain? I'm going to always look for space. I'm going on there against Javi and Iesta, the best players in the world at the time, world champions, but always look for space, get shots away, nonstop defending from the front. That's my job. That's my job. That's my job. That's my job. Specific, controllable, positive. And so I think if you're a bowler, a batsman, just having these little, they could be technical cues, they can be physical cues, they could be mental cues, whatever they might be, but they're two to three tasks related to the responsibilities in your role or related to a weakness you want to improve or a strength you want to magnify or a coaching point you're trying to to, to improve. You, You have going out onto the crease or you have going out onto the pitch or whatever it is, I just think they're vital because you're really you're breaking them down into these three aspects of specific control and positive does that make sense to you as a bowler yeah i mean that's this is very very similar to how i approached what i did and and what it does do and i think it's really worth noting is that it really takes you away from being outcome driven it, yeah. it's it's and, and, I, and you've spoken about this being processed process goal process orientated and, yeah. and that is fundamentally what it is if i if i Sport as we know it, and, and even speaking to some young lads today, is that the fickle thing about the sport I play and a lot of other sports out there, if you look at the percentages, you lose more than you win. And it's a hard, hard game in, in that sense. So are you willing to lose more than you win? But when you win, it will be great. And from that point of view, it's it's that should shine through that you're trying to just control your process because the outcome 
you're trying to put yourself in the best possible place to achieve that outcome if you do that if you only focus on the outcome and you and say you achieve that outcome having just focused on trying to score the runs you haven't even figured out how you did it so when it comes to the next five games you're going in there pretty blind because you haven't actually got anything to control and and you know how you did it you don't know where to step you don't know where to move you don't know all of these con- areas of of the game that could be a part of it and you have no idea so it is really really important to have that i love how you call it these match scripts and it's changing that self talk within your brain um i think even one of the examples i saw was you talking about i'm going to win every header in the the air and instead of saying that i'm going to win every header i'm going to jump high with positive intent or jump strong with positive intent and and, yeah, and then the outcome I, yeah. is coming later the outcome comes later it's it's having a more sophisticated relationship with performance or competitiveness you know you asked me before we came on to sort of allude to my podcast and i had a great conversation with a woman a former rower olympic rower called kath bishop who's written a great book about this she's written a book about redefining uh, competitiveness essentially and uh, what it is to be a great performer um and and i i think it's so important it, and this stems to player well-being as well when when you understand that ultimately look all i can do is go out there stick to my tasks stick to the things that i can control um there's other things you can do you know i talk about game face and squashing ants and things like that and you know we probably won't get into them today but you know that it it it's understanding you know okay what are my tasks and how am i going to go about doing those executing those to the very best of my ability and it's understanding that's all i can do and actually that's a more adaptive sophisticated relationship with performance and competitiveness then oh, i've got to win i've got to win i've got to be determined it's and, and and oh man it just lewis it has i mean again you probably would have shared these changing rooms where you've lost and everybody look, the, there's something to be said for a collective um, sense of doom and gloom when you've lost. I, I don't think you're ever going to take that out of sport. But, and I'm not saying we celebrate losses, but I mean, I, I've been in, I've hardly not been in an elite sporting environment that the whole place hasn't been in a sense of the organization hasn't been in a sense of depression for two days following a loss, you know, and it's, and it's just like, well, is this useful? Is this really useful? Mm. As you said, we're going to lose games. Mm. We are going to lose it. We don't want to lose games, but we're probably going to lose games. That's okay. What we have to understand is how we're going to deal with that. And so being task oriented, having this better relationship by saying to yourself, I'm going to stick to my task. I'm going to give myself that feedback loop, mark out of 10. How well did I stick to these tasks in my performance? You know, what was my mindset like, mark out of 10? And if I can come away from it and say, you know, I did a pretty good job there, you know, um, then I've, you know, that's fine. Move on, move on to the next week, learn what you can and move on. So I, I think it is about, for me, having little techniques like a match script that help us to have a more sophisticated relationship with performance. I think that's so vital. Yeah. Look, I, I recognize the, the time we've been talking. I don't want to take up much more of your time that you've given plenty of Pomodoros so far. Um, <laughs> well, I, I think the last thing I'd love, I'd like to ask, and I think I've got so many notes here and, and God, I really hope we could maybe even go into a round two uh, another time. Yeah, um, of but I, I would like to just ask, as, a, as an athlete myself, as a pro athlete, speaking to a sports psychologist was something that I actually, I moved away from. I did it once or twice, regretted actually now having done that, maybe because it was, it was the, the, the way in which it was put upon me or maybe my approach to it. I don't know what it was, but it was a, I don't know, again, seen as a negative thing to do, yep. whether it's yep. self stigma or society stigma. So for those out there that potentially aren't thinking about going to their mental side and, and engaging with a sports psychologist, do you have anything that you would say people can start with and a great starting point to, to look at their mind, to, to delve into their, their psychological state within the game, almost without going to that sports psychologist to start with? 
Nearly read my books, Lewis, obviously, yeah. and follow my Twitter feed. Um, no, look, uh, and it, there's, there's so many good books out there. I, I, and and it's, a, it's a, I suppose it, it, it leads me on to a serious answer. It's, you know, um, don't be scared to go on Amazon, read a book, uh, get a book, read a book. Um, there's some really good ones out there, simple ones, ones that don't go into theory. Um, that's not necessary. Um so uh, I think there's that. I think try to find good sports sites on on Twitter where you might find, you know, it'll give links to good articles or post, you know, good posts that make you think. Um, I, I think it's more, I, I think it, 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 how can I put this? I suppose it's, I always say to players, keep an open mind. Um, don't just accept anything. And I think if you've, if you've got an opportunity to read something, don't just accept it, go in skeptically, uh, but don't be, strive to avoid being cynical about it. Fine, be skeptical. You know, is this for you? Is this going to help you? Um, you know, go in skeptically, but not cynically, um, because there's just too many good performers these days. You know, for instance, in Great Britain, every single Olympic team now has sports psychology support. Mm. Uh, you know, nowadays, I mean, we just, Anthony Joshua now, I think the guy's almost, his sports psych is almost full time in there with him. And he's not full time, but he's, you know what I mean? He's, he's in there often and traveling with him. Um, you know, the best competitives in the world are now seeing the value. Um, of seeing a sports psychologist, not just for their performance, but for their well-being, and both go together. Um, I think, um, and what I would say is, if you're in a position, if you're in a team where a sports psychologist has been put on you, um, which I personally don't think is a bad thing, I, I, I think a big problem at the moment is actually, this is just my opinion, um, Lewis, I, I, I think again, I use this term sophisticated. I think that teams and organizations, and I mean the very top here, who have the resources to, to bring in a psych, they need to have better processes whereby the psych is included within the coaching setup. I think that every team needs uh, at the top level a psychologist working with them to make sure that the coaching staff are delivering effectively from a psychosocial perspective. And I think pers personally, my belief, and this is where you need to be a good sports psychologist, but I, my belief is that every single player needs, we need to find a way in teams, the head coaches need to find a way to make sure that every single player is invested in sports psychology in some capacity. And that just might be from one, you know, one player who says, well, you know what, I think I'm pretty good here, but I, I respect that I have to maybe help my teammates with their psych, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that's the shared mental model that we talked about earlier. Um, I think everybody needs to be involved. And so I think that when you're in a position in a team, if you're fortunate and you're at the elite level and you're, and you, um, and you've got a sports psychologist in and the head coach wants everybody to work the sports psych. I think it's for you as a player, have the best conversations that you can with a sports psychologist. Again, be skeptical, but not cynical and go in open-minded and try to, you know, try to have a conversation with the sports psych in terms of, look, I think I'm pretty good at this. I think I'm pretty good mentally. Um, but I know that I need to help others. How can I help others? Or I think I'm pretty good mentally, but I'm interested in exploring getting better. How can I get better? I would give myself nine out of 10. How can I be 10 out of 10? I think that that to me makes you a better, will make you a better player. If you can drive the process with the sports psychologist, I would be saying to the sports psychologist, how can you help every single player be included? here in the psychological process, the psychosocial process. But I think if you can, as a player, say, hey, look, I'm pretty good at this, but I respect that there's ways I could get even better. Mm. I think that, that there you're going to be the best individual you can be and the best teammate you can be. That's my opinion. And I think that's 
that is the next step for a lot of these teams and organizations at the very elite level is every player going, I'm, I'm on board. I don't have much to do, but I'm on board and I'm going to do something here, but we need to work together rather than disregarding the sports psych, co-create with the sports psych, you know, investigate what you can do. That, that to me is what I would say. Yeah. That, what a great, what a great place to end it. I, for sure, don't leave any stone unturned as a player. That is for sure. And there's nothing so. to lose. There's nothing to lose at the end of the day if you've invested some time into your mind. That is, there is nothing well, it, it, yeah, last thing to say, it's, it's one, all I'm saying is maybe it's one thing. You know, the, the whole don't leave any stone unturned, yes. But I also recognise there are people out there with the kind of personalities who they don't necessarily want to think about too much stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's okay, but respect that you're part of a team. And there's going to be teammates who need that from you. And, and part of the organization is we've committed to a process of being the best that we can be psychologically. So what one small thing can you do right now? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, brilliant. Dan, where where can people best find you? Where's the best place to reach out? The, the podcast, the books, the site, yep. the, the academies. I give you relentless freedom here to, to <laughs> plug whatever you want to get out there. So... Let's start with the website, danabrahams.com, and you can find all books and academies and things like that on there, Um, danabrahams.com. And then I've got a whole bunch of social media, Um, danabrahams77, at danabrahams77. That's my main Twitter account, at abrahamsgolf for all you golfers, and then at sports psych show, which is excuse me my podcast twitter and that leads me on to say my podcast can be found just google sports psych show uh and you'll find it sports like show dan abrahams and you'll find it instagram is at abrahams sport where i'm posting daily and um facebook at dan abrahams soccer at dan abrahams soccer where i regularly where i post a little article every day actually a short post that i'm putting up on linkedin every day as well so that's that's uh, built up a bit of a, a followership. So um, yeah, that's that's me. And thank you very much, mate, for your time. Appreciate I'll, it. I'll be leaving all the links in the show notes. That's where people can find you, reach out, and I I appreciate you coming on. This was honestly one of the the most interesting conversations I've had for sure, and 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 deep and and meaningful stuff that people can get out of this that that we can add into. A, I'm going to take away some of this stuff already. The Pomodoro technique. Yeah, I'm using. <laughs> I'm giving that a go. Um, So yeah, mate, thank you so much for, for coming on. No worries, buddy. Thanks, mate.